to be in a place where there's a ship's, ship's wheel, funnels, and life preservers. This is the first time I've given an economic <coughs> speech where you can say that. And I feel a lot like Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> I want to climb onto something and point to the horizons and snog Kate Winslet. <laughs> but I won't say that too much because my wife's in the audience. <laughs> um, it's great to talk about these things because it gave me a chance to look at the history of the Titanic. I hadn't really thought about it much. And use the story of the Titanic to talk about the design problems I think we have, not just in the New Zealand economy, but in the global economy. And to do that, I wanted to start first with the Titanic itself. I didn't realise this, but because I'd heard about the amazing uh, uh, watertight compartments, and I couldn't work out why did this thing sink. And they didn't understand why it sunk either. Because it had these 16 watertight compartments. But what actually happened when the Titanic, which saw the iceberg and decided to veer away, when it hit the iceberg, it hit it side on. And so it wasn't so much tore into, it was sort of crunched against. And the steel used in the Titanic was what they called battle grade, battleship grade steel. And it was very high in sulfur content. And when it was cold, it tended to shatter rather than bend. So when the Titanic brushed up against the iceberg, a whole swathe of the battle grade steel shattered. And five of those compartments, these ones up the top here, filled up, which shouldn't necessarily have been fatal. Because the designers of this ship were saying this ship should last for a couple of days before it sank. Plenty of time for everyone to get off. The trouble is, though, because of the design of the ship with the brittle steel and these watertight compartments, the water went into five of the compartments, the ship bent down at the bow, and the compartments, can you believe this, were only built to just above the waterline. They went up right up to the deck. So there's a big gap between the top of the watertight compartments and the deck. So as the ship went down, the water started flowing over the compartments into the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Also, because of that, the ship bent right down and then broke in half and sank in two and a half hours. And of course we know so many people died. What I want to talk about today is the design flaws in the global economy that are now starting to be shattered and sunk by some of the things that are heading our economy. I'm going to talk about some of those design flaws. And to do it, I want to introduce you to a guy you've probably never heard of. Who here has heard of David Harding? One per well, that's great. One person knows the story. He is thrilled. He is over the moon. He's worth 1.47 billion pounds. I'd probably be over the moon too if I was worth 1.47 billion pounds. He's an interesting guy. He's a 50-year-old physicist. Now, what's a physicist doing earning 1.5 billion pounds or being worth that much? 50 year old physicist, he was a contemporary of Stephen Hawking, but in 1987 he decided to form a hedge fund. A hedge fund that builds essentially a bunch of black boxes that predict the price of commodities and then creates algorithms which trade those commodities against often other algorithms in nanoseconds faster than nanoseconds, faster than you can blink your eye. He and, amazingly, 110 other scientists have built these black boxes to trade commodities. And it's been doing since 1987. It now has close to 30 billion pounds worth of funds under management. It generated returns on equity, or returns, of 14.8% per year for the last 10 years. So most people here would know that's a pretty amazing return. This company is quite something, this company called Winton Capital. It has stats on the prices of commodities going back to Babylonian times for wheat. And also the price of wheat in Britain going back to 1209. And he has employed astrophysicists, meteorologists, statisticians, amazingly talented people 
to forecast and build these algorithms to trade commodities. Extremely talented, amazingly productive to run a hedge fund. And I'll talk about him later on. He, unfortunately, is one of the reasons we have some design flaws in the global economy, and that affect us. I'll come back to David Harding and Winston Capital at the end. Firstly, I want to talk about one of the major design flaws in the global economy. I use this chart. Many of the debt charts in the world are very similar. And I love a good long-term chart. It doesn't quite go back to the time of the Titanic, but almost. Back to another gilded age, the 1920s. This is US private debt to GDP, and obviously there was a spike up before the 1929 crisis, and then a, a heavy deleveraging through the 1930s as private individuals either paid, paid back their debt or it was wiped out. It was essentially restructured. Companies, people went bankrupt, banks lost money, banks fell over. And through that period, through the 30s and the 40s, some of that gap, some of that pressure was taken off by government spending. We all know what happened through the 30s and 40s. There was, amazingly, and this is quite interesting, a lot of spending through the, 90s and 40, the 1930s and 40s on amazing technologies, avionics, aeronautics, nuclear technology, a lot of government investment in technology. Now, they weren't doing it to stave off global warming. They were doing it to win a war, obviously. But what it meant was there was an amazing amount of innovation and government money spent on finding new technology. Now, that many of that, much of that technology was used to power the economic growth of the 50s and 60s. And the debt-to-GDP ratios through the 50s and 60s started to grow, but not to painful levels. Then something really took off through the late 80s, early 1990s. The US Federal Reserve started cutting interest rates under Alan Greenspan whenever there was any trouble, and banks were let off the leash. The repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which happened in the late 1990s, essentially meant that the gambling banks, the investment banks, were able to use the balance sheets of commercial banks, the solid, stable ones, to go on gambling sprees, to create all sorts of amazingly fancy derivatives, and to create money, lots of it. And so we had an enormous build-up in debt in the United States, and this didn't just happen in the United States. This is the ninja loans, the no income, no job, no asset loans, through the late 1990s into the 2000s. It's only just started to deleverage now. What this says is that the global economy is overloaded with debt. You sort of know that. But what it doesn't say, what you perhaps don't understand, and it's, it's quite a scary thing to think about, as we go back to some normal level of leverage, 100% or so, just think of the social, economic, political pain involved in that, taking that chart down. That's what happened then. That's the sort of stress the global economy is under. <clears throat> that is the design flaw that could sink this global economy. And unfortunately, it's not just America. This chart shows you what's happening all around the world in terms of percentage of debt to GDP. The UK is the worst. Nearly 1,000% of GDP. This is the household, government, financial, non-financial. We're relatively low, but still way too high at 200%. But these are the other countries and what their debt levels are. As Rick said, we overconsumed through the, the 1990s and 2000s. We did it by loading up on debt. We weren't actually generating enough income to support the lifestyles we had. So we pulled forward that consumption. We did it in a financial sense, and as Rick pointed out, we did it in an environmental sense. The world is sitting weighed down by a huge debt load. What we have also seen over the last 20 to 30 years is a real increase in the share of GDP captured by corporate profits. So this is a chart showing the percentage of GDP captured by corporate profits going back to the 1940s. Um, slight recession there. During recessions it tends to bounce down. But through that period, there was a sort of stability around that 6% mark. But since the 2000s, 
it has sprinted higher. And in fact, since the recession of 2008-9, it's back up to record high levels of corporate profits. And what are those corporates doing with all that money? Well, it turns out they're hoarding it because they're scared. And what do you do when you hoard money? You don't invest it. You don't invest it to employ people. You don't invest it to come up with new technology. You buy government bonds because you're scared. And this chart shows in real terms, so taking out the, the effects of inflation going back to the 1950s, US non-financial companies have stockpiled cash at an enormous rate. Right now, it's up to nearly $2 trillion. Now, the way they've stockpiled that is to put it into government bonds. And this is a hoarding, which means, bizarrely, that we have, for example, 10-year government bond yields in the United States, with all that debt, at one, less than 1.5% last week. That's because so much money has been hoarded by companies, particularly the richest companies, and the richest individuals. Because over the last 10 to 20 years, a lot of the income that's been generated the product of productivity gains has been shuffled up to the top, to the top of the corporates and to the top of the income sphere. It's now being hoarded. It's not being used to mobilise the resources of people who are unemployed and some resources. This is one of the design flaws right now which is holding the global economy back. And one of the reasons why corporate profits are so high is because a lot of those corporates are financials. This chart shows you the total debt in the global economy and financial profits, so bank profits and hedge fund profits, Mr. Mr. Winton Capital. Since the 1980s, it's been scaling up, both the debt and the financial profits. Sort of no surprise. New Zealand's big four banks, in fact, if you include QBank, the big five, they're now generating almost 2%, their profits are almost 2% of GDP. A good chunk of that has been exported. A fundamental part of our structural current account deficit problem is the profits generated by those big four banks being sent back to Australia. Now, why is it that we have this problem? Because we took on a lot of debt. And as Rick pointed out, we brought forward consumption and spent it. Now we have this debt. And also, on the resources side, we bought fraud consumption. And now the pressure is coming through in the form of higher prices. We have a banking design problem. Somehow, we need to take the banks back and break them up again. Mm -hmm. As FDR did during the 1930s when he created the glass steel Act. And unfortunately, we have an ageing design problem. This chart is from, from the Treasury showing what happens to New Zealand's debt to GDP from about now, which is currently quite low, as Rick and, uh, and, and others have pointed out. It sprints higher, that's the best case scenario, that's the worst case scenario. It sprints higher to 223%. If we don't make any changes to things like the retirement age, our entitlement system in public health, and uh, uh, many of the other settings in our economy, particularly around taxes. We essentially run up big budget deficits. We bring forward more consumption. We build up the debt higher if we make no changes. This is a design problem in the New Zealand economy, but unfortunately, the same design problem is there for most of the developed world. And even places like China, where there is an ageing problem too, coming in 10 to 20 years' time. These are the flaws these are the design problems in the global Titanic. We are sailing ahead to a huge problem with the demographics of our societies, the ageing issues, and we're doing it highly indebted with the distribution of income in all the wrong places, too much money hoarded, not being invested in new technologies, in new ways to <coughs> essentially use the same amount of resources for all these extra people. So, the case I'm making today is that we must find ways to share those incomes better. So when people get that income, they spend it, they invest it, they don't hoard it. People at the middle and lower income parts of the spectrum tend to spend and invest. 
But is it the very highest? And we've all seen the charts, I didn't put it in here, showing the share of income for the top 1% tend to hoard it. Bizarre really, we've got so much debt, but so much money sitting around doing not much. I think there's a case for government to take advantage of that hoarding at the moment, which leads to low interest rates for everyone except for Greece and Spain, to invest, and to invest heavily. I think we need to definancialize our banks. Now New Zealand, to be fair, isn't quite as bad as some of the other countries in the world. That's why I think there's a case for a financial